Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopath Fiona Chin, uh, co-founder of a Kidney Coach Kidney Disease Solution and our formulas, Kygenesis. And I'm joined again today by the beautiful, amazing Dr. Ellie Campbell and the dog there in the background. Yeah. And um, Ellie is a family physician, a functional medicine doctor. Um, and what I love about Ellie is, and if you go back and watch some of our other podcasts, you'll see her story about how she really got into functional medicine to treating one of her favourite patients and her story of what happened with um yeah, her journey, which is really amazing. But the other thing I want to say about the amazing Ellie Campbell is that she has just written a book called The Blood Pressure Blueprint, and it is all things blood pressure and how to treat it. But what is really amazing about this book, there it is. Thank you. Hold it up. Be proud, woman. It's an amazing book because think everything you know about blood pressure and just think salt and diet and not exercising, and then think, throw it out the window. You don't know anything. Dr. Campbell knows everything about blood pressure because there are so many things that contribute to elevated blood pressure and cardiovascular disease leading to things like chronic kidney disease and all of those sort of things that most of us aren't taught about um, as a layman person, as naturopaths I'm talk about, uh, taught, and that even transfers across to the medical community of how much the medical community don't know things like certain genes and their contribution or even simple things like tooth infections and those sort of things. And Dr. Campbell is an absolute expert on all things blood pressure. So, Ellie, thank you so much for joining me again. I'm always so yes, grateful. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm so, so excited happy to be here. Yeah. Yes. So I thought we would talk all things blood pressure related to kidney disease because we know that hypertension is the second leading cause of chronic kidney disease being in stage of that. And that Heart disease and heart failure and heart attacks are, I don't know, where do they sit on the cause of death in the U.S.? In the yeah, world? U.S. number one, cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in our country. February yeah. is American Heart Month, so we do like to focus our attention on hearts during February. It also happens to be Valentine's Day. Um, yeah. And so I think it's important because, you know, especially women, we tend to really worry about our breast health. And this, the media attention to breast health is wonderful, but only one in 31 women die of breast cancer and one in three women die of cardiovascular disease. Yes. So it's a 10 times bigger problem and people don't pay attention to it. Partly, I think, because breasts, um, we, we can identify a problem, whether that's by mammogram or physical exam or our partner finds something, but hypertension is usually silent. Some lucky people can tell when their blood pressure is elevated. They get a headache or their ankles swell or they feel a rush in their or a thumping in their ears. Those are the lucky people because mm -hmm. if they can identify that their pressure is elevated, they'll be motivated to make a change. But that's not most people. Most people, it's a silent stealer of vitality and organ function. And if we identify it by properly checking our blood pressure at home and at the doctor's office and getting trends over time, then we can start to identify who really has blood pressure problems and who doesn't. Because there's some sneaky things. Number one, there's this thing called white coat hypertension. And these are people who live all the time at home in perfectly good control. But as soon as they see somebody in a white coat, their blood pressure skyrockets. And we will over treat people, strip them of their nutrients that are needed to metabolize the blood pressure medicine and increase risk of side effects and complications, not to mention dropping their blood pressure to the point where they could get weak, dizzy and even pass out, fall down and get hurt by over-treating blood pressure if we diagnose it only by the readings we take in the office. And just like with a diabetic, I would never in a million years make a treatment for a diabetic based on a single blood pressure, blood sugar reading that I got in my office. I need trends over time. I need a continuous glucose monitor. I need three times a day blood sugar checks. Send me your log, let's look and see. And so now we need to do the same for blood pressure. And home, surprisingly, home blood pressure monitoring has only become a thing really in the last five or so years, right? It's not been commonly recommended to people. 
And I think that's been a mistake. And now that we know it, we can do better and we can start checking our blood pressure. I tell my patients that, um, you know, I think we, I like to think about blood pressure like son-in-laws, right? Or potential son-in-laws. You You're want to know what your right? son-in-law is like on his best behavior, but you also <laughs> want to see what he's like on his worst, crabbiest day, right? Because he's going to, how's he going to treat your daughter? You need to know these things. Well, I think the same is true of blood pressure. I want to see it. How good can you make it when you're meditating and life is grand and you have no pain and you slept well and you haven't had your coffee yet? What's your blood pressure look like? Or right after you drove home in rush hour traffic and there was a car wreck and you're an hour and a half behind schedule and your daughter needs something for school that she just told you about that now you have to stop doing everything to go run out to the store to go get that thing and you're irritated and cranky and now, what's your blood pressure look like? Because these are the moments of physiological stress that can drive your blood pressure into a dangerous range if you're not well controlled. And so we want to be certain that we know we see all these trends. So checking properly. And a lot of people make a mistake when they check their blood pressure. First of all, um, you have to be seated when you measure your blood pressure. You're not supposed to check it standing at the kitchen counter. You're not supposed to check it when you're lying down. Kudos to those dentists who take blood pressure in the dental office. I am so proud of them. But most of the time they take it laying down and that's yeah. not the proper position. We should be seated. We should be seated with our bottom to the bottom of the chair, our back to the back of the chair supported and our feet on the floor. If we don't do that, if we have our back muscles that we're using to hold ourselves upright, we can raise our blood pressure an extra 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Really? So, yeah. So we want to have back to the back. Now, I have a secret how tall I am. I don't tell everybody. I'm only five feet one. And so when I sit... <laughs> when I sit in a chair with my back to the back, my feet don't touch the floor. They swing mm -hmm. like a little kid. Mm -hmm. And if my feet are not resting on the floor, when I check my blood pressure, I can raise my blood pressure about 10 millimeters of mercury. Really? So we need our bottom to the bottom, our back to the back and our feet on the floor. I have never in my entire career been offered a step stool to rest my little feet on when they check my blood pressure. It's funny what small little nuances can do, isn't it? Yes. Another thing that we do wrong often in a medical doctor's office is um, we test the patient with a full bladder. Mm -hmm. Your bladder should be empty before you measure your blood pressure. Having a full bladder can add 10 millimeters of mercury to your blood pressure reading. And if your bladder is painfully full, that elevation may persist for three hours because of the way that we stretch that bladder and the sympathetic signals that are sent through your bloodstream. You know, we, we often will go to the doctor's office on purpose with a full bladder because we know they're going to ask us for a urine specimen. So mm -hmm. we're holding it and we're holding it. And they're like, hold on, let me check your blood pressure. Let me get your vital signs. And then I'll send you to the toilet to go collect a urine specimen. That's the wrong order to do things in. We need to send them to the restroom, let them empty their bladder and then check their vital signs. Or we risk raising their blood pressure just by doing it in the wrong order. Who knew, right? These are all things that are listed in the new, new 2017. CDC, American Heart Association guidelines. And yet I was never taught them in any of my continuing education things. Oh. Um, and I, and the reason why I learned them, uh, and maybe I'll tell you this, my little, my little dirty little secret about my book, which mm -hmm. is I consider myself not really to be a blood pressure expert. I consider myself to be an oral systemic health expert. I am an expert in the ways that the mouth is connected to the rest of the body, not only airway, but microbiome, oral health, um, gum inflammation, periodontal endodontic infections. These things play havoc with our immune system, with our, our oxidative stress levels, 
they change our biochemistry and our physiology, and they make us more likely to have heart attacks, stroke, and kidney problems. So I wanted to write a book about that. And as I was doing focus groups, nobody wanted to learn about that. Nobody cared about that. When I asked people what they did care about, they cared about their blood pressure. So I said, well, I do blood pressure in my office every day. I guess I'm an expert on blood pressure. You do blood pressure in your office. Every health professional does blood pressure in their office. So we're all sort of experts, but I'm going to take a little bit deeper dive and study a little bit to see what nuances I might learn about blood pressure so that I can put them in my book and create a Trojan horse so that I can pop out of the book and teach people about their oral systemic health and how their mouth is connected to their blood pressure and teach them what I want them to know while at the same time inviting them in on the cover of the things that they needed to know. It's stealthy uh, mission there, Dr. Campbell. I love it. It was. (laughs) So it's interesting. So you've spoken about the things that will um, artificially raise blood pressure, which may lead to an overtreatment in that area. Mm-hmm. Yet on the other side, what I think you're saying is we've got a massive undertreatment of things like the oral health and oral connection to things like blood pressure. So walk me through that. Walk me through the things that people might not be looking at when it comes to drivers of cardiovascular disease and elevated blood pressure. Yeah. I think the first one is probably, well, we we know it's lifestyle, right? We know that the lifestyle that people lead will drive their blood pressure crazy. We know that stress and cortisol and adrenaline will raise our blood pressure. But people don't realize, I don't think, that not getting a good night's sleep will raise your stress, your cortisol, and your adrenaline levels. And we, in many ways, don't respect our bedtimes like we used to. We don't go to bed when the sun sets and rise and get up in the morning when the sun rises. So we've lost our circadian rhythm that allowed some of this hormonal regulation to happen. We use artificial lights and we stay up too late and we get up too early and we don't get enough hours of sleep. And then so many people suffer from sleep disturbances related to airway issues. Upper airway resistance syndrome and sleep apnea are far underdiagnosed. Not everybody who snores has sleep apnea and not everybody who doesn't snore is free of sleep apnea. So we have to have a very low threshold. And I believe that anybody with hypertension, kidney disease, heart attack history, stroke history, or snoring history deserves a sleep study. The good news is we can do these things at home now. We used to have to send people to a sleep lab and they had to go to a hotel-like room with an observer watching them sleep. And it's hard to get a good night's sleep in that environment. But now we can do a a home test. You download the app to your phone. They set you with a little pulse oximeter on your finger, a watch on your wrist, and a little sticky on your chest. And you get to go to sleep in your own room, in your own bed, on your own schedule. Also, I think many people were afraid to do a sleep test because they felt like the one and only treatment for sleep apnea was wearing a CPAP mask. A hundred percent what I hear in my clinic too. And they said, I can't do that. I won't do that. I I, I would suffocate. I could never get used to it. I don't even go snorkeling because I can't stand that thing on my face. I would never wear a CPAP machine. I'm like, guess what? I've got a whole list of other treatments besides CPAP that can help sleep disordered breathing. They range from some of these things, right? I'll I'll teach you. Number one, if you are a mouth breather, you're using your mouth wrong. Mouths are for eating, noses are for breathing. So if you are breathing through your mouth at night, we need to get that closed. How do you close your lips while you sleep? There's a whole variety. Some people wear chin straps. I lip tape. So I use a piece of um, cloth, micro pore tape. I cut it so it goes from underneath my nose to the middle of my chin. I fold the corners over. I leave the corners of my lips open. Some people like to put horizontal tape 
but I'm a drooler. And if I collect a lot of spit in my mouth, I kind of gurgle and choke on it. So this way I can drool and wipe it off. Me too. Um, also, when I was a mouth breather, before I got fixed, um, I would get a very dry mouth at night. And this would allow me to slip a straw and take a sip of water. Once I stopped breathing all night through an open mouth and used my nose, my mouth doesn't get dry anymore. And I don't have dragon breath in the morning like I used to. So I love my lip tape. When I, I went on vacation to the Amazon jungle recently, and I took my lip tape with me so that Very I could cool. tape my lips closed while I sleep at night. So mm -hmm. lip taping for some people with mild sleep apnea can be dramatic. I had a patient that um, has been suffering from temporomandibular joint distress. Um, He's a tooth grinder and he's been grinding so much his enamels worn down and his jaw muscles are sore and he has headaches and he woke up fatigued and sore every day. We've been seeing the craniosacral massage therapist and the TMJ dentist and said, well, why don't you just try lip taping? So he taped his lips closed. And for the first night since he was a child, he slept straight through the night. He called me the next day and he said, angels sang to me last night. He said, I it's a miracle. I had no jaw pain. I had no headache and I woke up refreshed. When I saw wow. him last week, he's been doing it now for six months. And he said, it's the best thing I have ever done in my life for my health is take my lips closed. Wow. So who knew such a simple intervention could solve such a complex chain of symptoms related to the fact that we are not closing our lips. You need to have a good oral pH. And if you're mouth breathing, you get a very acidic mouth. And if your mouth is acidic, you get the wrong oral flora growing there. The bacterial balance is off. You don't make this enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. It's made by bacteria on the bottom of your tongue. And if you don't have the right bacteria, you don't make that enzyme. If you don't have that enzyme, you can't make nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gaseous signaling molecule. It's so important. It won the Nobel Prize. And it is, it is a vasorelaxer. So it helps open and relax blood vessels and lower your blood pressure. So if you're a mouth breather and you have an acid pH and you don't make NOS, then you get high blood pressure. So wow. let's close your mouth. Sleep with your mouth closed. It's a miracle. Some people who've been mouth breathing for a long time develop something called nasal disuse atrophy. Their nose forgets how to do its job. It has to be retrained. So if I tape those people's lips closed for the night, they wake up smothery because they haven't learned how to breathe through their nose. So we have to do it little by little, five minutes first, then 30 minutes, then a whole TV show, then a whole movie, then a whole afternoon, and eventually through the night. Yeah, wow. Such a simple thing. My um, my parents used to tape my mouth together as a child, and so I am a nose breather, and it was one of the things they did back in the 80s because they they were yogis and knew about this sort of stuff. So I grew up with a taped mouth. And I'm at, at the time, people just like your parents are a little bit nutty, but I look back and go, thank goodness they did that. Yeah, they were, they were well ahead of their time. Really um, yeah, we don't want people to do it if it's unpleasant, if it's uncomfortable, if they're choking, if they can't tolerate it. It's not something you should force. But if it's something that you find helpful, by all means, do it. You can help your nose open up, too. There's some other tricks. Um, there make some nasal strips that go across the bridge of your nose that simply pull the fascia just a little bit, a millimeter or two, up and out making a, a, a wider nasal passage. They also make these little splints. They're little plastic things that fit up in your nostril. They sell them at every drugstore here in, in our community in a little starter pack with a small, medium, or large size. And you can decide which one works best for you and then repurchase when you need to at the appropriate size. So these little nasal splints can open and dilate your nose so you can breathe better through the night. Another treatment for sleep apnea that people, um, oh, I have another patient that um, sleeps with a little stuffed animal tucked underneath her chin because that's what keeps her chin closed <laughs> and keeps her lips closed. Stuffy. <laughs> it's very sweet to think about that. 
I don't know how she keeps it there all night, but she claims that she does. Um, another treatment for sleep apnea that people um, are not always aware of is um, a mouth guard. Some people have specialty made mouth guards that pull their tongue just a little bit forward, keep it out of the roof of their mouth. When I was diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea, um, I got diagnosed because I was on vacation with my sisters in Alaska. And we all stayed in the same cabin, the same room. And uh, my my younger sister, I, I'm the oldest of the of all the girls, but my youngest sister said, Ellie, you snored so badly. You snored worse than Susan did. And my sister Susan peels paint off the walls when she snores. And for me to snore worse than Susan was such a huge sisterly insult. I was... <laughs> So when I came home, I said, Jim, my husband, Jim, do I snore? He said, well, not only do you snore, sometimes you stop breathing at night. I sit there and I watch you and wait for you to start breathing. I was like, why didn't you tell me? I had no idea. He said, I thought you knew. Like, I didn't know. So I ran off and had a sleep test. And I had my own sleep apnea, not moderate, not severe, mild, but I did snore very loudly. So I asked my dentist if I should do CPAP. And she said, oh, no, no, no. You have mild sleep apnea. We don't have to do CPAP for you. You have other options. So she put me in a, in a device. When I was a teenager, I had braces. And they removed four teeth to make room for um, my, my teeth to be straightened. And in doing so, they put me in a headgear that pushed, so I had to wear this, you know, headgear thing, and it pushed my entire face backwards, closing up that gap of those teeth that they had pulled out, which took 15 millimeters away from my face, ensuring that there would be no room for my tongue when I was an older person. And so as uh, he was doing the standard of care for orthodonture at the time, and they were not airway aware. They were not airway centric orthodontists. So I ended up with straight teeth and sleep apnea as a side effect. So fast forward 40 years, now it's time for my dentist to undo some of that. And she put me in this Vivos device, which has a little key that I would expand. So every few days I would expand this that stretched my jaw wider and longer so that over the course of the next two to three years, I increased the size of my mouth, making room for my tongue. And I no longer snore. And right. I no longer have sleep apnea. And they cured it permanently. Now, it was not inexpensive. It cost the same as braces. Yeah. And I finished my Vivos device. Now I'm in Invisalign to try to close up all those spaces from I opened up when they put me in the in the device. So I'm not done with it yet. I'll still, I'm, I think I'll be wearing a retainer indefinitely because you don't move your teeth when you're 63 years old and expect them to stay there without a little help. Yeah. So I imagine that I'll be in, um, in, in my um, Invisaligns for retainer for quite some time, if not indefinitely. But what's fascinating to me is that I did not wake up tired, right? I didn't wake up unrested. I usually would wake up five minutes before my alarm, rested, refreshed, and ready to start the day. So I never knew that I had sleep apnea because I wasn't tired. Oh, wow. However, all the while that I was sleeping and my oxygen levels were dropping, my organs were being choked for oxygen. And so that's a very rapid way to accelerate aging of your skin, your heart, and your brain. And I really didn't want an older brain. So I'm very happy that I've treated my sleep apnea and that my oxygen levels are now always 97, 98, 99 when I sleep. They don't drop any longer. So um, sleep, treating sleep apnea is an important and critical part of managing your hypertension as well as your risk for heart attack, stroke, and kidney failure. And so many people have sleep apnea. It's, yeah, it's super yeah. common. So what else? So we've got sleep apnea. What else can happen? Is there anything else in the oral cavity? We've spoken about pH, nitric oxide, sleep apnea. What other things are not, people not thinking of when it comes to blood pressure? 
Yeah, um, I think we are starting to understand maybe as a society that inflammation is a driver of hypertension, right? And we know that if you have an untreated autoimmune disease, you'll have inflammation. If you eat nothing but junk food, you'll have inflammation. But I think what people don't appreciate is if they have gum disease or also called periodontal disease, that they also will have a source of inflammation. So if you brush or floss your teeth and you see pink in the sink, to me, that's a 911 dental emergency that says, Mr. Mrs. Dentist, please assess my mouth for inflammation. Now I'm a primary care family practice doctor and I have a spy test that I can do that tells me if you very likely have periodontal disease. It's a blood test and it's called um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a non-specific marker of inflammation. But when I pair that, another test called LPPLA2, which stands for lipoprotein associated phospholipase A2. It's an enzyme that's made by white blood lethal, lead, white, made by white blood cells when there's inflammation present. And we typically thought of that for many years as a marker of cardiovascular inflammation, a marker of atherosclerosis and hardening of arteries and an a marker that the blood vessels themselves were being plaqued and inflamed. But we now know that periodontal disease will do this as well. So if I see LPPLA2, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and the patient has any gum symptoms whatsoever, tenderness, pink in the sink, pink when they brush or floss, a metallic taste in their mouth, they're going to the dentist and they're going to be checked for periodontal disease. Yeah. Also, when it comes to periodontal disease, some people have a pretty clean looking exam. They don't have bleeding on probing. They don't have pink in the sink, but they do have inflammatory mouth bacteria that are living there. So many people in functional medicine are familiar with doing a digestive stool analysis, a poop test to look at the bacteria that live in your gut. Are they out of balance? Are there invaders that shouldn't be there? Are there parasites or yeast or other bacteria that are causing trouble? Well, the same can be true in your oral cavity. We're supposed to have bacteria there. We need them. They help keep our gums and teeth healthy. But bad bacteria are bad actors and bad bacteria can cause inflammation. And there's five of them that are the main triggers and they have long names. And we just use their initials, A, A, P, G, T, D, T, F, and F, N. We can do a spit test and look for these mouth bacteria. So when yeah. someone has elevated LPPLA2, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, we spit test them. And then we can target their periodontal treatment to eradicate those bacteria, sometimes rarely that requires an oral antibiotic. Sometimes it can be done with herbal medicine. Sometimes it can be done with a change in your home care, getting an electric toothbrush instead of a manual one, using a water flosser instead of a thick floss. Sometimes it's um, oil pulling. Sometimes it's laser treatment. Sometimes it's piezo electrode. Sometimes it's guided biofilm therapy. There's a whole litany of treatments that your hygienist and dentist can work on together to eradicate those ugly mouth bacteria. Because who would have thought that bad breath or gum disease bacteria can raise your blood pressure? But they can. Yeah. Yeah. It's, again, it's not anything that most people are thinking of. So, right. I mean, certainly you would think a toothache, a toothache will raise your blood pressure. That's pain. Of course, pain will raise your blood pressure. But toothaches are usually caused by an abscess at the gum root, the root of the gum. And those abscesses start someplace. They start with a little thing before they get large enough to press on the nerve. And all the while, there can be changes of inflammation, oxidative stress, blood marker abnormalities that make that leading indicators that tell me you're starting to get a dental abscess before you even have a symptom. Yeah. And if that tooth 
that has that abscess is a root canal tooth, previously been worked on by a dentist, had the nerve and the blood supply removed, it doesn't feel pain. You won't feel the pain of a root canal abscess until it gets large enough to press on the tooth in front or the tooth behind. And so another blood test called MPO, myeloperoxidase, it's another enzyme, also comes from white blood cells. We felt that MPO indicated arterial inflammation, arterial plaque rupture, but it also happens in dental root canal infections. We can wow. measure high levels of myeloperoxidase at the tooth root, but also in the bloodstream. So if I see someone who has a blood test with elevated C-reactive protein and elevated myeloperoxidase, they're off to the dentist to go get a cone beam CAT scan to search for stealthy hidden tooth root infections. It's, it's just amazing how that, you know, you've got dentists and really most people are just, oh, we're going for a clean twice a year and this and that. But really functional dentists should maybe be maybe routinely checking some of these things, especially if the case history matches up with blood pressure or a family history of cardiovascular disease as part as we do as functional practitioners we we screen and we check and we're all about prevention being better than cure imagine switching that into the dentistry industry where that becomes standard of care right so hopefully that 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 tidal wave has just started to gain a little bit of um steam uh i I am part of an organization here in the U.S. called the American Academy for Oral and Systemic Health. And these are those enlightened dentists. And we are making big efforts to try to teach these things to the young dentists and the young medical providers so that they, we learn to speak the same language. Because even though we have these leading indicators of a dental problem that could lead to high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, or worsening kidney function. Many conventional medical doctors don't know about these tests. You yeah. have to be sort of in the world of integrative functional medicine and prevention to even be tuned in to do these tests. And then I need an enlightened dentist to partner with who knows what the meaning of these tests are when I send them. So we're working hard to increase interprofessional collaboration and interprofessional education. Uh, I, in fact, I was on a call this afternoon with um, the Dental College of Georgia and the Medical College of Georgia here in near Atlanta, where I live. Um, and we're going to try to do an interprofessional conference this fall uh, of the medical students, the dental students, the dental hygiene students, the family medicine residents, the nurse practitioner students, the physician assistant students, all together in one room at the same time, hearing this conversation about leading indicators and predictors of cardiovascular health. As long as it's the number one killer in our country, we're not doing a good job of prevention. So knowing these secrets that I published in this book and that I'm teaching now to young students everywhere, I think can start to move the needle and lower those, those risks. Every single case of a worsening cardiovascular status in our practice in the last seven years has had a worsening of their dental condition. It's such a driver of these markers. I can't even begin to tell you how important it is and every time I've heard of a friend of a friend, somebody's husband, somebody's brother that died from heart, heart attack, I ask, by any chance, had they recently been to the dentist? By any chance, were they fighting a toothache? By any chance, was there any dental history in their recent past? And almost every case, the answer is yes. So I just... I'm just thrilled to know that we have the secret that we can teach people to move the needle. Yeah, and quite a, a simple solution by the sounds of it with what you're talking about. It's not that people are having to have all their teeth taken out. And, you know, it's quite, if you know about it, the, the protocols around it are affordable and doable and could save your life from right. And many And many people, I think, are, 
are afraid of the dentist, they hold off going to the dentist. We say to the dentist, on a good day, you save a tooth, but on a great day, you save a life. And I think that if patients understand that their dental screenings and their dental checkups are really life-saving screenings and life-saving checkups, they'll be a little bit more motivated to go. We also have to make sure that the dentists have the skill set to recognize the problems when they see them, because sadly, we've sent some patients to dentists who say, oh, that's just a little bit of bleeding. It'll be fine. I'll see it in four months. And they don't make any recommendations. They don't make any change in the treatment protocol, and they just hope it'll go away, and it won't. Um, so the oh, another thing that we can do is oral probiotics. We know that um, taking a probiotic for your gut can change your gut health. Changing the bacterial balance in your mouth can change your oral health. It can reduce the amount of plaque buildup that you make. It can reduce bad breath. It can increase nitric oxide. It can lower your blood pressure. So using a specific dedicated oral probiotic, and there's a few on the market uh, that we're particularly fond of, um, really do shift the needle. Amazing. This is such great information. And again, for people listening with kidney disease that might be driven by hypertension, you know, it's, and I don't know if you find this with kidney disease, but sometimes some of my, and I've got a big online group where people are doing our mastery course. And mom's like, I'm not sure what caused my kidney disease. We thought it was menopause, this and that. And because of you and because we've had a thing, I'm like, have you had any recent issues with your teeth? And she had. When we went back and had a look, we could see that she didn't have major hypertension, but we talked about some of the plaque stuff that, we, you know, you had spoken about in a previous podcast and, and we went back and did some um, teeth work and her um, EGFR has gone from, she's got one of the most amazing shifts in EGFR from I think it was 37 all the way back up to 75. So it's one of the biggest shifts I've seen. And that was when we dug into, I one of the things I thought was it was um, oral hygiene related and she had the gene. So that the gene with the, and I think I forget which one it is where the red blood vessels will produce more of this certain plaque um, when it's really, when the plaque gets inside the red blood vessel and makes it make plaque inside the walls. Yeah, I mean, uh, P9, P21, yeah. She um, had that. Yeah, and this is interesting too. You know, in Chinese medicine, we talk about meridians and we know that, you know, we do acupuncture on one part of our body and it affects something completely not in that part of the body. Well, somebody mapped out the Chinese meridians for the mouth. They're not traditional. They're not what they've been using for 10,000 years, but nevertheless, there seems to be this electrical circuitry connection and that the kidneys and bladder are the front two teeth on the bottom and on the top, but especially on the bottom. And so when uh, um, I had a patient with recurrent urinary tract infections, we couldn't get him cured. We couldn't get him cured. And I'd been to a conference and I learned about this meridian. And I asked her, I said, Catherine, you don't by any chance have trouble with your teeth. And she pulled down her gums and she said, these two teeth here? She said, I've been to the dentist seven times in the last year. We're not sure we're going to be able to save them. I've had five courses of antibiotics, three deep cleanings. Uh, ozone injections, and they're not sure that we're going to be able to save these teeth. There's just a, a chronic low-grade infection. So that was, I would never be able to fix her urinary tract if I can't fix her teeth. So right. I think that for our chronic kidney patients, we definitely want to make sure that there's not a source of inflammation that's draining their body's immune system and fighting, 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 so it can't regulate blood pressure, can't regulate um, other immune functions, and the kidneys take the brunt of that. I find this stuff just so fascinating. And, yeah, like I say, it was, it was because of the podcast we originally did that I even knew to ask the question. So you have saved one of my patient's kidney functions. So thank you. Yay, I love that. I yeah. love it. And you hope many more. I mean, that's, you know, I have this teeny tiny little membership based practice in suburban Georgia. I only have a couple hundred patients, 
but through the use of the book and podcasts like this, people can be empowered with information and then they, they can expand their knowledge base. Go into the internet, double check, trust, but verify, talk to their trusted healthcare professionals and say, I read in this book that I might have a problem with my teeth. And then I flossed and I've got this thing and it doesn't seem right. And now I'm here to get it checked out. Could we do a CAT scan? And the dentist is like, I don't do CAT scans. Well, can I be referred to somebody who does? And now you're empowered with information to take those next steps to take care of yourself. And yeah. that thrills to, to think that this, this information can be disseminated across the country, across the world. In fact, my book, um, I'm so proud. I've, I've had uh, five countries. It's sold so far in five countries. So besides the US. So I love that. That makes me so proud and so happy to know that um, this information is getting out there to, to anybody that needs it. And it's not expensive. The ebook is $2.99 American. So I think pretty much anybody can find that if if they have the ability to read an ebook. And so if people wanted to get a hold of your book, it's on Amazon. It's the it's blood pressure book. Yeah, oh, all over the world. I'll put the link in below for people. Ellie, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about when it comes to oral hygiene, oral health, and looking for things that drive blood pressure? I mean, the big take-home message that I'm hearing now is if you've got elevated blood pressure and kidney disease or a family history of cardiovascular disease, get your mouth checked. Absolutely. Um, You know, I think the mouth is the gateway, of course, to everything that we eat and drink. So we want to make sure that we're putting good stuff in there. We, you know, it, junk food is an oxymoron. It can't be both junk and food. It's one or the other, right? Real so, good point. I'm so good point. junk in there, put only real food, ideally, mostly plants, not too much, whole food, healthy things, full of micronutrients um, and tasty, right? We want to celebrate those taste buds and enjoy that time. Um, be present with your meal, be present with your company that you eat the meal with. I think these things are important. We want to choose food that's biodynamically grown. That's good for our planet. That's not robbing the, the planet of nutrients. And then to think about micronutrient deficiencies, this could be a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day, but I think many people are nutrient deficient and that's driving their blood pressure as well. We talk about low salt, low salt, low salt, get off the salt, get off the salt. And I don't think as many people are as salt sensitive as they think. I think what's happened is they're micronutrient deficient in potassium and and zinc and magnesium. And we get those micronutrients balanced, then they can handle a little bit more salt. Um, Some can, some can't. Some people are very salt sensitive and have to be very cautious about it but most people are magnesium deficient. If we get that magnesium up to target, then, oh my goodness, their blood pressure will drop, their bowels work better, their sleep is improved, their leg cramps go away. Magnesium can be a miraculous blood pressure medication. Yeah, totally agree. And I'd love to do a podcast with you on micronutrients. I'm writing that down to email you after this. (laughs) And I guess the last thing is some people need medication to manage their blood pressure, but there's a, there's a whole pharmacy of nature and there's herbs that have blood pressure like medication side effects. So for example, hibiscus tea can lower your blood pressure 20 points if you're willing to drink three cups a day. So, um, you know, you don't want to do that haphazardly by yourself. I would always use your herbs with consult with an herbalist or a naturopath or an educated clinician. Um, but I think that not everybody needs blood pressure medicine, even when their blood pressure is high, but yeah. they need their blood pressure controlled. It just okay. doesn't mean they need to have blood pressure medication necessarily. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Oh, amazing information, and we're definitely going to get you back to do micronutrients that drive blood pressure because I think that magnesium piece and stress and what we eat, that that's a whole other great big conversation, but a really important one to have. Any final words, Dr. Campbell, that you'd like to impart on our audience before we release you to your evening? 
Um, I would just say that people need to feel empowered to make changes. Chronic disease can be managed. Kidney disease can be improved and sometimes reversed. Heart attacks are optional. Strokes are stoppable. And dialysis is not your destiny. You just need to know the work. You need to do the tests and be willing to do the hard things to change your lifestyle, replete your micronutrients, get in the right nutrition and work with the right practitioner. And mirror, miraculous things can happen to your strength and health and vitality. So, wow, what beautiful words to leave and impart. And again, for anyone listening, that came from a qualified medical doctor where we know that kidney disease is treatable and potentially reversible. It's definitely something we've been um, privileged enough to witness in our community as well. And so it's it's great that we're starting to see this and hopefully over time this will become the norm versus right. it not being. Absolutely. Dr. Campbell, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, I'm going to put your details below and I'm going to put a link to your book as well. For anyone um, wanting to know the name, it's The Blood Pressure Blueprint by Dr. Ellie Campbell. If you head to Amazon, I'll put the link in there as well. You can download, as Dr. Campbell mentioned, the ebook. Or my um, thing that I like to do is I like to have the book. I've, I've written all through it. I like to write notes in it. And it sits there for patients because it's very nice to be able to hand them something where I can go see Dr. Campbell has said this. So that's always something that I personally like to do. But again, congratulations on the book. Um, it's amazing. And I, yeah, it's an think- easy read too. There's lots of case studies. It's not, it's not boring science. There. No, like, yeah. I, I, I got through it very, very quickly. And, and because it's, I would say the word I want to use is it was very compelling because of the case studies and just the way you've laid it out. So, um, and I love case studies. So I found it really like easy to follow and, and, and you know you don't need to be a medical practitioner to read it that's the other thing I wanted to say it was it's very much written for anybody out there who's curious about their health and how to prevent and and just wants to know how to do better when it comes to blood pressure and things like that so very yeah. easy I kind of wrote it with the, um, a middle-aged mama in mind because yeah. she's she's the uh the caregiver to her family and if she doesn't have hypertension she probably has somebody in her family who does and so I wanted her to feel um, welcome to this book and to hear stories and feel like we're having a coffee coffee conversation. Uh, many yeah. people, once they've heard me speak, they're like, I heard your voice when I was reading yes. your book. <laughs> yes, no, that's very true. Well, it's, it's great. So I highly recommend it to anyone with kidney disease, especially if, you know, hypertension is a driver or anyone in your family has hypertension. Again, I'll put all Dr. Campbell's details below and a link to the book. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. We're also on Instagram and Facebook and all those good places. Remember to hit subscribe and like. That way you'll get notified when I get Dr. Campbell back on to talk all things micronutrients when it comes to elevated blood pressure. Dr. Campbell, thank you again for your time. I know you've been busy and just got back from the Amazon and just celebrated a birthday not long ago. Happy birthday. Yes, I did. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And again, thank you for being part of our community. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye. Bye now.